how far away are we as an industry, public relations practice, from coming together on a common set of shared values, this uniformity in commitment? How far away are we from a adopting a common set of values? I think we're at the very beginning stages, truthfully. Um, I, I really do. We, uh, we need to get this into the academic environment, uh, this whole idea. Uh, it may be that we haven't identified the right values. I think we've identified the right values, maybe not all of them or maybe not articulated as well as they should be. But I also think that the values that we ultimately come together to agree on are ideas that we have to um, develop together. We, we need consensus of view. And a value statement is not something that you just force on unless we are all inmates in a prison we are a free society, and I think that the strength of one's commitment to these values is certainly going to be based on the uh, extent of your belief that they're true, that these things are important to us. I think that the, the articulation of values in our practice or our profession are terribly important in part because there is no licensure, there is no set academic course of study that we have to go through. Um, there's no particular degree, there's no certification, there's no, the FTC hasn't approved what we're doing or anyone else. The legitimacy of what we do um, has been based largely on cases and the standards set by people who went before us, such as Arthur Page, who, you know, even Arthur Page, though, he didn't write the book about public relations. The book was written about Arthur Page. And that became the book about the principles that apply to what, to what we do. And that happened not because Arthur Page forced his view out to the profession. It happened because a number of his colleagues and others who studied what he did concluded that he was essentially basing his work on a number of very important principles that needed to be codified and shared. Those principles emerge today as very strong pillars in the practice of the corporate communications function. The other thing I want to happen out of this I want a new page principle that speaks to values. And I want you to help me make that happen through the Page Center. I've talked to Jack Coton, and he said he believes there's enough written in the page documents and speeches that um, we could get together a principle, just like Jack and the rest of them created the current page principles. You know they wrote them, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, I know that uh, Arthur didn't. Yeah, no, Jack Coton wrote most of them, and and uh, yeah, the other the other people who worked closely with him, and they added one not too long ago. Are you willing? Can I ask a general question about the page principles and let you talk some about take it wherever you want to take it for the interview? You've talked about values. And, um, of course, Arthur Page comes to mind uh, when we think about the Page principles and the way those can be really read and understood as values. And I'm wondering if, if you'll talk about the Page principles and their, their value to the profession. Well, I think the Page principles um, have come to represent um, a real definition of how we intend to practice. They're not really a definition of... Uh, the technical aspects of, of communications. There's nothing in there about how to write a press release or the quality of the annual report you want to be putting out or the, the council. But what they reflect is Arthur Page's uh, true understanding of his role in um, the Bell system and um, the influence that 
he wanted to have over decision making. And I think that as um, Jack Coton and others reviewed the work of, uh, of, of Arthur Page, uh, they knew that these principles were important and that um, it would be um, very important for future generations to try to codify this. And, and that's what they've done, telling the truth. Um, you know, that too often in my book we get down to these one-liners, tell the truth, prove it with action, you know, recognize blah, blah, blah. <laughs> but once in a while you need to go back and read the whole statement about what do we mean about telling the truth and what do we mean about, you know, proving it with, with, with action. Um, proving it with action is probably one of the most important principles for me and it, it was an issue that I focused on um, in my career and that had to do with the behavior of um, an organization um, and making sure that that behavior was consistent always with the values that it publicly said were important to it. You know, the worst thing you can do and lose your integrity totally is to say that you believe in one thing and create a perception that you're, you're acting in some other way or in self-interest and away from that. So uh, telling the truth, proving it with action, that is behaviors, decision-making on tough issues in any business that is consistent with what you've said is important to your organization, that's the, that's the crux of it. I mean, you know, it, 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 from there it's about how do you articulate that, how do you write that, how do you place it, how do you get it. You know, all, those are all things that we can, we, you know, good education programs will teach people to do in our field. But understanding the importance of that function uh, as a part of what we do and is very important in the first place. And then secondly, how you execute that in, within your organization is another dimension of that. And the whole issue with that, I believe, comes down to our own, well, certainly our experience, our good judgment born on years of experience but also self-confidence in um, what we know to be true and what we know to be right about a situation and to be able to stand our ground, not to back down when you get into an argument with somebody who may see it a little differently, but to have the self-confidence to be there and necessary to put your career on the line uh, to, uh, to prevail on your, on your point of view. So that, that second principle in there holds um, a ton of stuff for me in terms of defining who we are, the importance of what we do, the philosophical end up underpinnings of uh, what we do. We don't show up in a management meeting with um, the decisions of old judges or court cases, which general counsel can support. We don't have the accounting practices and standards board, which the chief financial officer is going to bring. We don't have um, all the employment laws and practices that the HR person is going to show up with. Um, we don't have the FDA's requirements. Sometimes we do, but there are people in management who represent those points of view. We don't have any studied hierarchical academic uh, positioning and you know and and so how do you make that dog hunt someone would say well you know it's the strength of your convictions about who you are and the relationships you've already established with those people who are going to say you know I, I don't entirely agree with him but uh, there's a ring of truth in what he's in, he, in what he's saying and it it takes intestinal fortitude and a lot of self-confidence to stand in those positions and to prevail in those arguments. It helps a lot to be able to turn to contemporaries through the Page Society and to know that they're operating against a, 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 a statement or a, you know, a statement of principles that are consistent with what you're advocating. So. 
there's huge value in, in that. Let me speak to one other principle that I think is terribly important, and that's the last one, which is to remain calm, patient, and good-humored. It sounds silly to mention in the face of telling the truth and probably with action and you know all those other dimensions, but it's really important. And what it says is that um, it's important for us not to take ourselves too seriously all the time, to recognize that in our society, in our free society, in the organizations that we represent, there has to be a balance of views. We need to keep the team together. We need to keep everybody advancing uh, on the same track and inspired and committed to supporting one another. Um, you can't get there if um, you're just hammering everyone else saying, you know, we're not going to do that because it's not true or it's not the whole truth, or you know, you can take this kind of policing um, stance in your organization, and some people do, and policing is a good thing. <laughs> but I think where you really win acceptance and endorsement is if you know this, not taking yourself so seriously, and that the world is not gonna end tomorrow. Um, that, um, you're willing to um, compromise uh, when it's appropriate to compromise. Um, uh, you're, I think that that last principle also speaks to maintaining a commitment to a principle for a long term. You know, it's, it's hard to do in the short term. Tony Blair uh, has suggested that um, you know, you almost need a short-term public policy and then a long-term commitment to your, to your values. That you need to be able to live with both dimensions and be okay with that. And I know a lot of people who have found the peace of that idea that the commitment to prevail in the long term, but to survive in the short term. And that's where the art of our practice comes into play. It truly is. And I think it's a very important kind of understanding that we need to get into, particularly young people who are coming along in this profession. Line. Can ethics be taught? I know sh sure. How should ethics be integrated into a public relations curriculum in your mind? Should it be a standalone course? Should it be woven? throughout many courses. What's the best way to, to teach students about ethics? I, I, I think ethics absolutely can be taught in the, from the standpoint of how does ethical decision-making come into play in an organization. Can you, can you teach um, basic values? And that I'm not so sure about. But um, the... There's, there, there's a whole lot. I'm on the board of the Josephson Institute of Ethics, and we, uh, we have programs for businesses where um, Michael Josephson and his people you know, will go into a troubled company and do an assessment um, to determine where the disconnects are between um, the values the company espouses and the behavior that has occurred in that company, um, design programs, to teach teachers to carry this into the workplace, um, all of it aimed at uh, making good decisions and the right decisions for these business organizations. And everyone w wants that today because everyone is under the microscope, you know, in, in a in a very precise and detailed way. So there's sort of nothing that can be overlooked um, today because it's all going to come under scrutiny at some some point. And a lot of that has to do with you know, ethical behavior, ethical decisions. And yes, it, it can be done. Um, right along with that, though, needs to be the reinstruction or indoctrination into the values that an organization holds. That's really where it, where it starts. And if you think about an organization making a declaration of and whether it's developed by employees or management, you know, you're going to come out the same place. 
through in a value statement, you're saying, this is important about who we are and what we do. These are the dimensions. It could be putting the customer first. It could be any number of, of things. The quality of products um, could differ depending on industry. But management and employees or associates need to agree on what is really important about um, who we are and what we do. What are we going to protect for the long term? And now that we've done that, how are we going to behave against these beliefs? And once that declaration is made, this is what we know about who we are. This is what's important. This is how it's going to influence how we conduct our business. And this is the way we're going to behave. That's your ethical imperative. Because now you've said it publicly and you've invited, in effect, people to observe you, to challenge you, to question you based on those beliefs. That's your ethical imperative. So that, that says, you know, that we've got to make sure our decision making is consistent with that. Because the only way ultimately to build trust, which is what everybody is, is after in the marketplace, is observe behavior that is consistent with what you've said you believe is important about who you are and what you're going to protect and how it's going to affect your decision making. That's trust. When you've done that and then something happens and your public see that or they've, known, they've gotten to know about your organization they, then they make a judgment that well that isn't what they said they were going to do. That's not consistent with what I believe uh, that company stands for. That's, that's where this whole issue of long-term trust, long-term sustainable trust, um, you know, finds its genesis and its sustainability over the long term.